has anyone heard about blended tube feeding prior? Okay, so it's, it's getting out. I usually ask this every time because I don't uh, know how many people are, are even aware of it. But um, just a little bit of background. My interest in this subject or my history in blended tube feeding started in 1987 when I was a dietitian at Jackson Hospital and my colleague and I made it our business to get rid of it because we thought it was nasty. It was sitting up on the nurse's station for hours and clogged tubes. And, and then about six years ago we had a child who was quickly becoming unfeedable and blended tube feeding really saved his life. So uh, it made, made me an advocate of it and began to, to get interested in it. Um, so today what we hope to do is just really quickly go through some history to help you see how it's not really ever gone away. Um, look at some reasons why it's come back, the resurgence in it. Uh, look at some concerns that have been brought up by certain healthcare providers and look at the scant scientific evidence that we currently have. Uh, and look at some gaps in the literature that might be some areas of opportunity for us uh, as dietitians. Well, it went away. All right, so a historical perspective. Um, we have uh, records of tube feeding dating back 3500 BC. I doubt they were very successful. They were tried, uh, attempted with clay pipes. I can only imagine how terrible that was. Uh, but later on, they, they've used whale bones. They've used um, everything imaginable. Uh, rectal feedings were done through World War II. We even kept one of our former presidents alive for 87 days with rectal feedings. Um, animal bladders. But uh, first gastrostomy, quite a long time ago. Attempted, not very successfully. But in the 1950s, uh, you know, with the, with the creation of plastic and a blender and uh, surgical interventions and then the pump, hospitals actually made blended tube feedings. Dietitians would make those and deliver them up to the floors to the patients. But advances in enteral products and surgical techniques and uh, really had displaced these types of feedings uh, as they became more uh, common in the hospital. But there were people who were against that. Even as synthetic formulas were researched and developed, early pioneers uh, made these kinds of, of comments. Dr. James Barron, he was the one that developed the feeding pump in the 1950s. Uh, he made this comment, natural foods provide excellent sources of protein, fat, and carbs, vitamins, minerals, plus all other discovered and yet to be discovered essential nutrients, which we now can appreciate the phytochemicals in our food. Accumulating evidence stresses more and more the complexity of nutritional needs for the human body and up to the present time we know of no manufactured preparation which can surpass or even equal natural foods like beef, steak, liver, eggs, milks, fruits, and vegetables. So the inventor of the feeding pump was opposed to the development of processed formulas for tube feeding. In spite of those uh, objections, Emphasis on antiseptic standards and research supporting commercial products eclipsed the use of blended tube feeding. Some additional reasons. Uh, it was time consuming. Dietitians were having to make it and run it up to the floors and we had more and more people who were being tube fed. Uh, perceived requirement for large bore tubes. I remember back in the early 80s, you know, all we had were the large bore nasal gastric tubes, very uncomfortable. Um, frequent clogging that people felt like would happen with the smaller bore tubes. Uh, uncertain nutrient composition was uh, a problem. And then high risk of bacterial contamination fed, they believed, to immunocompromised patients. So again, this sort of, sort of gave us all a bent toward accepting the commercial formula. And then advances in enteral product development and certainly research dollars went toward that, not for food. And then medical plans often do not cover the expense of blended tube feeding. Lack of support from medical providers and even policies put into place prohibiting the use of blended tube feeding. So just really quick, where you guys are from in your medical facility, do you have policies that prohibit blended tube feeding or do you know? Does anybody know? 
So if somebody came to your facility and said, my child or my loved one is on a blended tube feeding, you wouldn't know if they could have that or not have that. Not sure. You don't know? We're not, like, directly in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But I think at Children's, I don't know if there's a policy, but I know we've had patients on blended tube feeding that they wouldn't want to be to have their child on blended tube Okay. Well, on the, I'm on the pediatrics practice group and occasionally I'll see a request, hey, our, our facility is changing policies, anybody got one they want to share? And then we hear from parents whose children had to be hospitalized for a period of time and they ran into issues if they wanted their blend to continue. So just trying to get a, a pulse on that. Well, we've come full circle, maybe. When I say maybe, is it, it never really went away. There was always the recipe, right, that we kept in the back of our diet manuals just in case, you know, a family runs out of uh, formula and it's a Friday afternoon and there's no way we're going to be able to get anything by Monday, so we'd whip out that recipe for the family. But in other parts of the world where there was no availability of commercial formula, certainly that was what we used. Um, and then sometimes just not able to tolerate anything we have to make our own formula. Uh, desire for more physiologic feeding. Now, this is one of the reasons why people are reporting its increased use. Um, and there is some emerging evidence to use it. And some people say, well, you know, when I feed uh, my, my child this, it's actually served as a bridge to oral feeding. Uh, we're actually involved in a study right now in head and neck cancer patients at the Montgomery Cancer Center and I have a student over there helping them out and she was so excited. She said, you know, the other day one of our patients uh, burped and he could taste food and he said, it's the first time I've tasted food in so many months and uh, she was very excited about that. So we decided after we met this little boy back in 2012, I wanted to know what were other pediatric dietitians experiencing. So we had a survey that we released to our practice group. And um, 57 of our respondents did use and recommend blended tube feeding. Now this was nationwide in our practice group, there's a few thousand. Uh, a lot of them did not work directly with patient care. So our survey represented, I think, about 10 to 15 percent, not a great representation. So maybe blended tube feeding is not happening that frequently, but that was what we got. 77% uh, reported positive outcomes, and 83% said the parents had a positive experience with it. Uh, the primary reason was the parent wanted it, or they were trying to address tube feeding intolerance. RDs that were not using blended tube feeding said they were concerned about formula safety, about inconsistent nutrient composition, lack of support, and ability to follow up with patients. And one of the stats I didn't put up here was the younger dietitians were, were more interested in it than us older dietitians who responded because we were taught, don't you put anything in that tube except formula or water. Don't do it. So then we decided to actually go and see what parents were doing. And we got permission from a website that is a, um, a support group for children who have to be tube fed and of their parents. And we had 430 respond. It was interesting that we had almost an equal amount. It was like a, a statistician's dream. 50% of the children were female and male and 50% were using full or partial blended feeds and 50% were not who responded. Um, the average age was about four years old and most of them had been on their tube for almost their whole lives. The frequently selected reason for using BTF was they wanted to give their child natural food. Interesting. Um, Dr. Franklin's talk about how we haven't been able to get our society to move toward plant-based, but yet parents want that. They've gotten the message and they want that for their tube-fed child. Uh, bridge to oral feeding, they wanted to reduce tube feeding intolerance or address allergies. This was interesting to me, less expensive than formula. And I know that we, uh, I work at Encompass Health and we send people out the door sometimes and their providers are not going to cover the cost of that formula so we have to find some other way to feed them. Uh, the number one reason parents uh, gave for using commercial formula was they didn't know about it 
or if they had attempted to use blended, they didn't find anyone in the community that could help them in the healthcare community. Uh, this was an interesting comment. More parents of the BTF-fed children said that they, their kid met growth goals more frequently than the formula-fed, and they had less GI issues than the commercially-fed children. But the next one's a little concerning. Uh, less than half of those who were using BTF were being followed. That's concerning to me because children can progress to malnutrition much more quickly than adults. They're changing all the time and I feel like we just need to, we need to be there for them. So I want to uh, play a little clip for you that somebody took the time to put on the internet because I think they might have had a bad experience with a dietitian. My son seems to not be tolerating his tube being formula. He keeps throwing up and his poop is all wrong. I want to change him to plenty food because I have heard that it can be awesome. Maybe you are feeding him too fast. We could try slowing down his feet or putting him on the phone. I'd really like to try the food thing though. If he still doesn't adapt to the formula, well, we could try another one. Or maybe his doctor would prefer he got a J tube instead. Did you hear me? I have been reading about using real food and how it has helped so many people. It seems like common sense to me, just blending up food. Will it help with a diet plan? No, I'm sorry, I can't help you with a diet plan. Why would you want to do that when formula is the best thing for your son? I am starting to think that formula is not the best thing for my son. Also, I think food is what people are meant to eat. Since you were a dietitian, I thought you might be, you know, into that. Besides, there is no medical reason my son has to have formula. Food is not what you fed people are supposed to get. That's why they invented formula. It is complete nutrition and okay. But my son is throwing it up. That could be right. And this goes on for five more minutes. So probably somebody was pretty ticked when they had this encounter, you know, to um, go out and produce this video and put on the web. But has anybody seen this before? Nobody? Okay. Um, the thing is, patients and parents who are BTF devotees are very adamant about this. They have very passionate feelings about this. And they will probably go it alone if they don't get some help. Now, when um, I was asked to come and talk about this, I decided to reach out beyond my little sphere of practice and uh, put something out there for, for our whole practice group and said, hey, if you were to go and speak to a group of dietitians about this topic, uh, what, could, what would you share? And so the question is, what drives you to provide blended tube feeding for your child in spite of the fact that it's extra work, might not be covered by health care, you might not get support from health care, um, possibly limited uh, support from schools or hospitals, you know, what drives you to continue to do that? And the first person who responded to me was a dietitian out on, on the uh, West Coast. Her name was Megan, and this is her son. She has a 17-year-old son with severe cerebral palsy. A G2 was placed when he was about seven years old, and she said he did terribly. So she started to give him real food and she met with tremendous resistance from the medical community. She decided to continue on with the real food, go it alone, but she went back to school and became a dietitian. And she said, that has been my life's work. And she started this uh, real food blend support group and she posted this question for me on her website. And I collected, uh, in, in just a few hours, we got 58 responses. So again, these people are very um, devoted to this. And it's, uh, the responses that I got, I could sort of categorize. And they were very similar to a paper that I reviewed that was published over in the UK, the qualitative study where they interviewed parents of blended tube fed children. Um, many, many of the same themes kept emerging. So I'll go through these. So that was the question that we posted on Megan's website. I'm a full-time working mom with three and a half year old um, and one is 
trait dependent, I batch and blend on the weekends. She was saying it's not difficult. I'm a single mom with a medically complex one-year-old with congenital CMV. I work full-time, college, take care of my son. Some days it's like running a marathon, but you can make it work. I'm 25 with a neuromuscular disorder, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, and I require total care. The way I see it, if I was eating by mouth, the people who assist me would be cooking for me anyway. Blending is no different. As a medical professional who's guided many families toward the miracle of BTF, I know how the medical world thinks. They project their opinions regarding how hard it must be to raise a child. Rather than burden them with BTF, why not just pour formula down the tube? One doctor told a family that BTF is a fad. It's not a fad. It's making food available to a child. We struggled with finding a dietitian to help us blend. They told us it would be hard, time consuming, and even dangerous. We blended for months before we finally found one who would help us. Again, that's that going it alone. Our son's on a trait, mobile and active. My husband and I work full time, have a nine year old and a business. I'm also a Girl Scout leader. It only takes a few minutes every night to blend my son's food. It's so simple that my nine year old can do it. I love blending. I feel like there's a lot I can't control in his life, but I can control his diet. Just knowing he's getting good real food makes me feel good. My daughter is two, eats four to five meals a day. My boyfriend and I both work, but we take turns making her food. It might seem like more work, but honestly, I think it's faster and less messy than feeding a typical toddler. I've blended food for my son for seven years. I have two other children and I work part-time in homeschool. I feed my tube-fed son just as I do my other children. It's easier than trying to feed my picky eater. Give him what she wants him to have. I'm a foster mom to a medically complex child seen by 11 doctors with numerous appointments. Blending his food is the easiest thing that I do. I changed to blended feeding when it dawned on me one day that my son had not had a vegetable or a fruit in five years. Why do we need permission to feed a patient real food? So I thought that was another interesting perspective. My Tubi will be 11 in April. She's been on Pediasure 1.5 most of her life. I've tried to get a nutritionist to help me, but the insurance doesn't cover the cost. I've blended, but my problem is I'm not sure how much to give her. How do I know she's full? How do I store the feeding and send it to school? God, I'm so lost, but I really do want to help her. And I hear the agony in that mom's voice who really wants to give her child food. You know the way most parents are. They really want to take care of their child. I heard uh, several other conversations or comments about the fact that they wanted their child to feel a part of the family meal. Having them in another room on a tube feeding with a pump, just, it just wasn't part of their family life. And so they opted for tube feeding just for that part alone. So if we look at recurring themes, these posts along with that other study I was telling you about, BTF prep is really no different than preparing food for the rest of the family. The time commitment is worth it. And I know there are people who don't cook. Uh, there's a study that was done several years ago, I think it was published in 2011, and of the 33 children that this gastroenterologist uh, transitioned over to blended tube, only one family decided not to do it and said, because we just really don't cook. Okay. Um, and my tube fed child's blended tube feeding makes feeding more natural, part of family meals. Another recurring theme is I can't get help or support or I get great help. There were several of those comments. Um, I want to help my loved one who is tube fed. So I, I think sometimes parents who want to do this are being maybe perceived by some people as, you know, they're going against medical advice. We even had one family that DHR was called to them because they were doing blended tube feeding. Um, so the dietitian had to meet them at their home and explain, no, this is okay, it's all right. They're not uh, doing anything that's wrong. Now to give you an idea, to give you a different perspective, I want, want you to watch a happy clip. What do we do or what do they have to offer um, for me? 
because of the evacuations from the lower part of the state. And it was just a little overwhelming for my little sensory girl here. So we decided to come outside so that her sisters could have a little extra place time before it's time to go. But it, it is also lunch time for Ebony, so I wanted to hop on and to show you. So this is a bully bag, and it already has Ebony's food in it. I prepped it um, before we left, actually, actually. Did. So um, this is her bully bag, and it holds up to uh, 375 mLs, so it is more, much more than a, a meal for for Ebony. So that makes me a little happier, right, about her getting her the support that she needs. So given the importance of providing patient-centered evidence-based care, and we as healthcare, healthcare providers might need to reassess our position on this, uh, especially when we're being challenged by what we see. So I want to take on some concerns, and the first concern that has seems to be reiterated over and over is this idea about infection, risk of infection. So what we did is we set up 27 mock feedings at the local hospital there in Troy. We took a blended tube feeding recipe and they had two versions of it. This was a recipe developed by UNC Chapel Hill. One was with a baby food base for parents who might be traveling and the other was a whole food base for when you're at home. And we compared that against uh, the hospital standard polymeric formula. And we hung it in a hospital room. We prepared the feedings downstairs in the hospital kitchen. We took it up. We even violated the hang time by two hours. We let it go for four. And we tested it at baseline two hours and four hours. And all of them were below 10 to the three colony forming units. They all met the requirement by the FDA for safe tube feeding, even when they, you know, were, we violated that hang time and they didn't clog. Um, we did the same experiment later on in 50 homes because the home internal nutrition population is certainly expanding. Uh, more and more people are on it and that's the group that seems to be using it the most. Um, also that seems to be the group that we're getting a little problem with uh, reimbursement from providers. So. We took uh, 50 homes around the university and we took a meal kit to them that was basically the food prep version of that same recipe since we had some baseline data. Uh, the only requirement we had was they had to be independent, living in the home, and their blender had, could be disassembled. Some blenders can't be disassembled. We had them wash their blender the night before, let it air dry. We brought the, the meal kits in the morning, they prepared it, we took it back to the university and we tested it at 0, 24, and 48 hours since in our survey of parents, a lot of them would make it for three days and store it. And what did we find? Uh, we found, let's see, what am I looking at here? Oh, wait, uh, I need to go back a little bit. 
sorry about this. I added this last night. Um, the, the risk of infection is usually based on published work that was done in other countries. So we look back at the last 20 years of all the published work that we found, other than our hospital-based study, the other ones were done in Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Philippines. Let me get this off of there. And you can see that both the commercial and the BTF were contaminated. Uh, now maybe the commercial not as frequently, but they both were contaminated. In every case, the authors state it's because of the handling, it's not because of the substrate per se. So I think that's important to mention. Uh, our objections in the past have been based on studies that were carried out in conditions that were quite different than what we might expect in the United States. And that's why we did our hospital-based study here. So uh, another reason why we felt like we need to do them here. So this was our study that we did and published in 2019. They all met criteria. Then we did the home study. Um, and what we found there is 88% of the samples met the U.S. food code criteria for safe cons food consumption. So they were below 10 to the, 10 to the 3 colony forming units. 97% were below 10 to the 5. And there's some international standards that say it's okay to feed people at 10 to the 5. Only one, one product was slightly above 10 to the 6. And our, our microbiologist was like, well, I don't know why we're all concerned. We swim in the ocean water and it's 10 to the 9, which I know we don't want to feed people dirty food, but I think that was a good thing for me to frame our results in. Um, and then at home, they were remodeling and she had cat litter boxes in the kitchen. So some things to think about. You know, maybe that was why it was contaminated. In any case, our results were quite different from what we've seen in the other published studies where BTF was overwhelmingly uh, contaminated and exceeded safe food handling standards. Another thing that we have to remember is that we have more bacterial cells in and on our bodies than we actually have human cells. I mean, sometimes I feel like I'm just a transport system for a microcosm. Um, as one dietitian pointed out, we're not exactly putting food into a sterile environment, are we? And then we have you know, the hydrochloric acid in the stomach, so maybe, maybe our cut points are a little extreme, or maybe we're, maybe we're uh, preventing blended tube feeding because of one concern, but maybe that concern is overstated when we look at the benefits that blended food tube feeding might give. Uh, it was a study, they repeated our study in UK dietitians, the survey, and that was their number one concern. We were worried that its bacterial count would be really high, although no dietitian ever found any BTF-fed child got an infection from it. So that's worth noting. The second objection that we saw both in our study, the Canadian study, the one we did here, is that there's an unknown, inconsistent nutrient composition. You know, what I'm feeding this kid, what we're feeding this child. Well, question. Is dietary monotony an advantage? Do we really want to eat the same thing day after day after day? Um, most commercial formula are very monotonous. They are they're the most highly processed food I can think of that's on the shelf. And we know that diet diversity is associated with a diverse gut microbiome and there's all sorts of advantages with that that are just being uh, discovered. The macronutrient profile of a blended tube feed is superior because it contains the more slowly absorbed carbohydrates from whole grains, fruit and vegetables that have been associated with decreased inflammation. Uh, I believe this guy was in Canada. He transitioned 17 children with short gut from a, high, a hydrolyzed, okay, hydrolyzed commercial formula to blended tube feeding. He tested their microbiome diversity and found that it increased, but there was a decrease in adverse GI symptoms and the number of medications that they needed to control those also went down. So they went from an expensive hydrolyzed product that had a reduction in medications, a reduction in overall GI symptoms. In a recently published study, they found, uh, they went back, this was Children's Hospital, I think it was Cincinnati. 
they went back and they looked at these kids for a year who came to the hospital, the ones that were uh, blended tube fed versus ones commercially fed. Uh, they found those on BTF had reduced respiratory infection rates, they had reduced hospitalizations, uh, overall they grew just as well, in some cases a little better, but not statistically different. This study was pointed out to me, I, I missed it, but I had a colleague uh, in Europe who called me about it. This was done in Europe. They minimized diarrhea in a critically ill patient. So what they did in the uh, ICU, which you know diarrhea is always bad in the ICU because of all the antibiotics. And so they randomized patients to get BTF versus commercial and there was far less diarrhea in the blended tube fed population. And when you think about this concern about bacterial infection, we're giving it to very immune compromised people, and yet they still had better results overall. And then original study I told you about, Penny Uck, he reduced uh, tube feeding intolerance in 33 children by switching them over to BTF in his practice, and these were outpatients. The, other, the third objection is that BTF may be contraindicated. So one of the things that people say, well, if you're going to put food in a tube, you need to have a pretty big tube. Um, minimum French size 14. Well, several dietitians pointed out to me that they are successfully feeding children with a 12 French. And really, it's not the size of the tube. It's the diameter of where it's going into the body that really matters. And those are pretty standard. Uh, we were concerned with the new infit connectors. Have y'all seen the infit yet? Nobody? Well, at our, uh, in our cancer center study, we have uh, some of our patients have now, when they're putting the, the gastric tubes in, they're getting the infit and they were worried that they might be too small. We've had no clogging whatsoever with our blended tube feed patients. Uh, what Mayo Clinic did is they said, well, if you're concerned about that with a small bore tube, just make sure that the family blends the food for five minutes. So if you're worried about clogging, they did some blender studies and found out that works the best. Um, another contraindication, well, we want to make sure that this person is volume tolerant. One dietitian adeptly pointed out that a lot of times kids are not volume tolerant because they're not tolerant to the commercial formula. So once you put them on the blend, they actually become tolerant to certain volumes. Must have a mature um, gastrostomy site. You say, well, you wait two weeks, right? Well, again, the question was, why? Why is commercial formula more advantageous than a BTF after G2 placement? There is no evidence to support that. Uh, BTF is not appropriate for a tube-fed patient with multiple food allergies. Again, you just simply make the food as if they were an oral feeder and remove those things that would provide an, an allergy reaction. Again, no evidence. Uh, there are published case studies of BTF in patients with even metabolic disorders who do well. BTF is too much work and stress for families, and I think that you saw families need to be able to make that determination. Uh, and also, the industry has responded by producing, I think there are five or six products out there now, that are blended tube based, they're whole food based, that families can use in addition to what they blend at home. Also, resolving tube feeding intolerance can certainly reduce the stress brought on by families. So that leads us to this question. Maybe there are potential risks of not using a real food blend. Let's think about uh, gut dysbiosis resulting in GI issues, suboptimal microbiome the increased need for GI medications, a presumed need for hydrolyzed products, inability to wean from the tube. Uh, that little boy that I told you about earlier, we, he had already had two fundoplications. We couldn't get him past 25 mils an hour, and he was quickly becoming unfeedable. But that day that we put some baby food green beans in his tube and he didn't retch or try to vomit, he had no pain, it was like, mwah, you know, light from heaven. Um, what about the increased risk of systemic inflammation because of lack of plant-based anti-inflammatory phytochemicals? We are denying these children that when we insist on a commercial-based feeding. 
missed potential opportunities for a bridge to oral feeding and improved caregiver or patient satisfaction. So there are some risks perhaps of not giving this. The, as far as developments we've seen in the last eight years, nine years since I've looked into this, the market is certainly responding with new products. Um, reimbursement is improving for blended tube feeding and for those products because they do tend to be a little more expensive. Um, I've, just last week we were doing some research and we found where a grad student, I forget the university, she's actually developed an entire blended tube feeding system where you put the food in, it blends it in these little bottles, uh, it um, can be used to store the food, get it back out, blend it one more time before you put it in the tube. It's an all-in-one blending system. Uh, the Bowley system is also available. Uh, we're going to be testing that one at the university coming up because there's a doctor at uh, one of the larger hospitals that's concerned about bacteria, so we're going to test that for them. Um, but I'm sure there's more coming out. We don't have guidelines. Now the UK still says we prefer commercial feeding, but if you do this, here are some guidelines, and I think we need those developed in the United States. Right now, uh, Aspen guidelines still recommend using commercial formula. So we do need some guidelines. And hospitals are changing policies. Uh, when I've been to different conferences, I have seen some posters at least where uh, hospitals are trying it. They're running some protocols and seeing what the outcome is. And so far we haven't seen anything negative. But there are some gaps in the literature. We certainly do need more studies. And I personally would like to see dietitians doing these studies um, and contributing to the science. So some parting thoughts. We may be perceived as dietitians as sending an inconsistent message when we insist that tube fed patients get the most processed food out there on the market and yet we tell other people to go plant based. Would you agree? Maybe that's uh, <laughs> but it's a message that some people are receiving uh, around us. Our policies of acceptance of conventional wisdom may not be aligned with optimal patient-centered care and what people are actually experiencing out there. And so we need to be advocates for our patients. If somebody comes and says, I'd really like to try this, at least be adept in it. You know, find some resources. There are plenty that are out there so you can help guide that family. Maybe they're really not capable of tube feeding. Uh, sometimes the best we can do is offer something in between. When I assess a family and I feel like they probably don't have the capacity for safe tube feeding, I recommend a partial. I say, well, how do you feel about putting some stage one baby food? And it still makes them feel better that they can do that. Oh, I'm going too far. Um, and blended tube feeding represents an opportunity to advance our practice and contribute to the advancement of nutrition science by showing truly that food is medicine and medicine can be food. And this was submitted by in that uh, survey of parents and I thought it was so profound. She said, one day I read the label on my son's tube feeding formula and I thought to myself, this is just corn syrup and cow's milk and I wouldn't feed that to him every day if he could eat by mouth, so why am I doing this? That's when my journey to blended food tube feeding began and it was the best decision I ever made. And this is a little fella who started it all for me. Uh, he's now completely weaned from the tube. He's a teenager and doing great. So if you have any questions or comments, I would love to hear them. Okay, I'm going to go this way, all right? Um, in my practice, I work with a number of families that are choosing to do the ETF route. But some of my families are telling me that they find it hard to do in their busy schedules, and they are now being bullied by the people who support ETF so much. So I've had to actually advocate on both sides. Oh my What's goodness. Going on in that arena as well. You know, this whole thing of the mental health piece, we, we had, we actually got IRB approval to do a third arm of this, of this bacteria study where we were to go to homes of people who blend, collect samples, bring them back to the lab and test them. And we felt like they'd be clean. Do you know that we could not get anyone 
allow us to come in and collect. And I even had a dietitian in Florida who has a thriving practice with this and they're like, no, we're not doing it. They, they feel like that as dietitians we represent industry. Some of them believe InFit was designed to keep them from feeding their children. So there's a, when I said bridging the mindset, yes. We've, we've got to be open to both sides. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that we, I have only worked directly with one patient who's doing blended two feedings, and she act, she's actually doing more juicing because she's um, on a protein restricted diet. So it's it's made a huge difference for her, but just in, and I know you touched on this, but in, in the general population, like my own family, friends that I consider to be well-educated, sort of normal people, I find huge food safety issues. And so just my own sort of bias, I guess, is I have, I have concerns about like food safety and whether people are refrigerating and that sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I also think on the flip side, like these are the same things they do, their families are eating anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of a, a challenge and a hurdle for me in, in terms of actually recommending. Exactly. Mine too. The very reason I got rid of it. But as you see, we're basing it on those studies that were done overseas. In one of those studies, I didn't mention this, but the hang time was 18 hours. It's no wonder 97%. And they tested it at the end of 18 hours. And all they did was test blend. None of the studies reported how it was prepared. Not one. So I just feel like that we've been trained using some data that maybe we should have drilled down into a little bit more. Um, our two studies so far are showing it's perfectly safe. You know, below 10 to the 6 is really low. It's lower than sucking your thumb. And that's just going out into homes or going out into the hospitals. So I hope... Maybe you'll think about it a little bit differently. Yeah, I just haven't, um, I've, I've really only had one patient mm -hmm. that wanted to do it. And like I said, she's done great on it. Um, you know, just thinking about the general population and their sort of food safety, like leaving meat out for five or six hours and then taking it out and then eating it again. Yeah, that, those sorts of things. So, like, you know, and those are, are good, good things. The, we started trying to find out the, the one sample that was spoiled. We tried to figure out what food was it. So we tested milks. Do you know we used UHT milk? I'm talking shelf-stable milk. We found the bacteria came from the milk that had a three-month expiration date on it. In other words, it's not going to expire for three months. So what I'm saying is I think that we're probably eating food all the time that's more than 10 to the 3. Maybe our cut point's too low. I don't know. But good point. Okay, I'm going this way. Who's next? Yes. I'm not sure if you covered on this already, but what would be the price difference from the, um, I'm sorry. Formula versus? And the formula with the parents at home and within the hospital. Okay, if you make blended food yourself, it's cheaper than formula. If you buy, yeah, hospital too. If you buy a, uh, a commercially prepared blended tube feeding like Kate Farms and some of those that are out there, it's actually more expensive. For our cancer center study, we did not want to burden the cancer patients with having to make blended tube feeding. And I know I shouldn't say burden because obviously some families want to do it. Uh, but we just decided that they may, may not do it. So we got a company to donate product to us. And I was surprised. We donated $80,000 worth of product to us because every pouch is $9 to make real food. Um, but, you know, Mayo Clinic, they wanted to do the study with us, but they insisted that their families blend the food. Well, they, these are head and neck cancer patients. They are really, really sick. So they had such a high dropout rate, they suspended theirs. But we're going on, and they're watching us, and we're watching them, you know, to see future directions. But yeah, that's kind of the price differential. Now, they do have people on staff that will help you get reimbursement. Doctors can write the script in such a way that it could be reimbursed if you can show that none of the other formulas have worked. 
question. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess what is like the standard like, like protocol for making a blended feed, and like are there any foods that should be avoided? Great question. Um, if you will look in the journal, there is a an article by Walia published a couple of years ago, the Registered Dietitian's Guide to Homemade Blended Tube Feeding. She'll tell you, don't throw celery in there. <laughs> there's some things that you don't want to put in there because they will mess it up. And there's always a good food base, like you want to look, look at your protein first and then go from there. You wouldn't you'd want to put more starchy vegetables than you'd want to put green vegetables because you're trying to get the calories in there. So there are some guidelines that you need to follow, especially with the oils. You want to make sure that you get the healthy oils in that good omega-3 to omega-6 ratio and sometimes you have to add a little extra salt. So there's some things that to think about, yes, when you do that. And there's some published recipes already out there that have already been analyzed and there are different calorie levels. Yes, in the blue. Um, I know you said that the blenderized tube feeding has superior macronutrient composition than the regular formula, but is that the same with the micronutrient? Well, it depends on the recipe. One of the studies that was cited uh, said that it did not, but again, these were just they just went into the home and pulled whatever the families were mixing at that time. It could be that in the total diet for the week, it was fine, but on the individual days, it wasn't. Yes? Hi, so I used to work as a formula lab tech at Children's Minnesota, and I was sort of wondering, because I've seen it kind of on both ends of the extreme, where I've seen recipes online for like homemade in which sounds like the worst idea I've ever heard of. But on the other side of it, I can see that there might be like formula industry pushback from polymerized tube feedings because obviously they profit from people buying their products. So I was wondering if you had thoughts on either of those. I would not buy a, I would not try to make an infant based. But blended tube feeding can certainly be used as, as young as six months according to the literature. I've not had one that young, but that's when you can introduce real food. We haven't had pushback from industry. What we've had is industry actually coming up with their own brands and more coming because this is driven by the consumer. Obviously, this is not healthcare pr practitioners going, hey, we want to have these products. It's the people who want it. Our message has reached the tube feeding population, diet diversity, plant-based, and that's what they want. Other questions? Satisfied your curiosity? And I have five minutes to spare. So always leave them wanting more, right? Okay. Thank you.